everything happens in his time. <laughs> Even when we push or force, something it still happens when he wishes it to happen. And I pray that God will give us openness to his word, to his insights and to his riches of glory which he prepared for us through the Bible. Amen. We are still in our story with Joseph. It is called Discovering Values from Joseph's Story or from Joseph's Life. Amazing story, amazing material which provides for us hope, provides for us understanding of many things. And it gives to us great example of someone who is not only survived, but who has been absolutely amazingly used by God for increasing big number of people who have been part of God's family. And he influenced... Scripture says that there were many Egyptians who left Egypt as a result of Joseph's involvement and as a result, of course, of God's involvement. And those Egyptians, they got opportunity to enter to the promised land. It is absolutely prophetic, amazing picture for us, for many nations to enter a promised land. And I believe that there is promised land inside of us and there is a promised land outside of us, which is Israel, Temple Mount. And you know that it is a great unrest right now. There are some clashes between people who hate each other. And actually there is a commandment in the Bible to pray for the peace in Jerusalem. So we have to stay in our duty and to pray for the peace in Jerusalem where Christ one day will come. Discovering values from Joseph's story, part two. And as I promised to you, we will come to a more clear understanding or to reminding to us that there are many parallels between the lives of Joseph and Jesus. Jesus and Joseph were both born through miracles, as you know, Jesus through the virgin birth. According to Gospel of Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 through 23 and Joseph through Rachel's barren womb which was opened by God eventually we remember that after he gave seven sons to Leah he opened Rachel's womb we read that in book of Genesis chapter 30 Joseph's father loved him more than his brothers we know that Unfortunately, it was absolutely obvious and tempting to all other brothers. Jesus is the beloved son and preferred one of the father. Next line is, both are described in the Bible to be very pious men who received revelations from God. Jesus and Joseph both went to Egypt in their youth. Both began their life's work at the age of 30, Genesis 41 and Luke 3. And the last one, the course of the lives of Joseph and Jesus were dramatically changed by the power of dreams. It's amazing that sometimes we do not really keep attention to the dreams which God gives to us. Joseph became an interpreter of his own dreams and the dreams of others which he used to save everyone's life, including his own. It was also a dream which led Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, to flee Israel for their lives to Egypt. Can you imagine if he would see that dream and wouldn't listen to that? In the same way, it was a dream of Joseph while acting as prince of Egypt, which led his family out of Israel and into Egypt. After the danger was over, God called both Joseph's family and Jesus' family out of Egypt and back to Israel as an act of salvation. Book of Hosea chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 2. And just came to my mind, is it possible for the world outside to influence the area of dreams inside of us? No. God preserved the area of dreams for himself and it's between him and us. But we have to be attentive to those dreams. It doesn't mean that we have to follow every dream which we see. But we have to pray that God will give to us sensitivity and wisdom and discernment. Actually, there are some people whom God equipped to interpret dreams. Even among us, there are people. It's one of the calling from God to interpret dreams, to interpret visions, and to interpret languages. And we have to practice it, and we have to be attentive to what God is showing. And a little bit more sayings about the power of dreams. First one, Lawrence once said, All men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds awake to the day to find it was all vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men, for the many act out 
their dreams with open eyes to make it possible. And as I said, area of dreams is absolutely independent area and it really depends upon God. Next is, the best way to make your dreams come true is to wake up. <laughs> and the last one is good. After she woke up and told her husband George, I just dreamed that you gave me a beautiful pearl necklace for our anniversary. What do you think the dream means? You'll know tonight, honey, George replied. That evening he came home with a small package and handed it to his wife, delighted, and opened it to find a book entitled The Meaning of Your Dreams. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people do manipulate or try to manipulate by, by the dreams which they see. And in case with Joseph, as I already told you, he hasn't been grown or mature enough or wise enough to bring his dreams to appearance, to share his dreams with his brothers. He hasn't been sensitive at all when he shared his dreams with his brothers and family, and we will see that even more clearly today. Joseph the Dreamer, Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 11. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. We actually read this account and it just for us to remind that we're still in chapter 37. Joseph the Dreamer, part 1, Genesis, as I said, 37, verses 3 through 7. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. Even it says he that he has been born to him in his old age. We still remember that there was a special promise, and I believe that Israel, do you see it says here Israel and not Jacob. And as we know, when God mentioned Israel instead of Jacob, it means that he speaks about spiritual matter. Spiritual matter or prophetic matter or the matter which really influenced the future. And as Israel, the man whose name was Jacob, when he became Israel, he became a spiritual man and he knew inside of his spirit that Joseph was special. So it's not only because uh, he gave birth to him at his old age, but still he made an ornate robe for him. I believe he neglected or he hasn't been sensitive enough to his other sons and he caused great case of jealousy and anger and envy, of course. Verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Have you noticed sometimes me and you, we struggle to say a kind word to someone? Have you noticed that? Sometimes you feel inside of yourself that you really struggling. You want to say something nice, but it takes a matter of strength, inner strength, or you almost gather yourself to say something nice. It means that something is nesting in me or you, and we are obligated to deal with that. God said to us that we have to be sober, we shouldn't allow this root of bitterness to grow, to be nested in our inner being, otherwise it can poison all of us, and poison not all, only all of us, but area around us. Kindness should exist, not only in us, but also around us. And Joseph had a dream. So Martin Luther wasn't the first who had a dream. Joseph had a dream a long time before him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. I don't think that God gave to him a dream to share with his brothers in order to raise the level of hatred from them. I think he gave to him a dream for the proper time to share. And of course, situation wasn't the best for him to share. But he, anyway, he said that dream. And I would tell you that when you will prophesy, wherever or whenever you will prophesy, it means that some people will be upset. When you will preach the word of God, whenever you will preach the word of God, if you will preach straight from the word of God, some people would be upset. Some people would be disagree, but some people even would be angry at you. Verse 6, he said to them, Listen to this dream I had. Problems with brothers also were that they were concentrated on Joseph. 
they dwelt in a human level world. They never really extended themselves beyond their family, beyond situation, beyond the ornate rope, beyond this colored rope. It wasn't about his rope, it was about future, it was about the destiny. But they were really low, they dwelt in a low realm. Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Do you remember I told you that we as God children, it is granted to us a right to stand upright. To stand upright means to be free, to be honored. So God gave to us the honor and right to stay upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Do you remember that the name of Joseph carries the meaning to add, to add. It's now fulfillment of this prophecy about Joseph himself in a dream. That first act of gathering and second act of worship or honor or submission. So God gathers us to Christ in order for us to bow down to Him. Those two actions God makes in order to keep, to preserve His family. In a scripture there is a term which is called kinsman redeemer, male relative who according to the scripture, to the Torah, had the privilege or responsibility to act for a relative who was in trouble, danger or need of vindication. This idea is most clearly illustrated in the book of Ruth, as you know. Christ can, however, be regarded as an example of a kinsman, redeemer, since he identified himself with us and redeemed us because of our need. Do you know that book of Ruth is a book about the future of all nations? Do you know that book of Ruth is a prophetic picture of what's going to happen in the future with all nations when they will come under the supervision and protection of kinsman redeemer who is Christ. And in this dream we see that Joseph acts in a capacity or in, in an institution of that kinsman redeemer. So he gathers his brothers around him and they worship, they respect, they pay respect to him as a prototype of Christ. In the book of Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 we read that both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Today Vlad when he prayed he said we can call Jesus brother because we are invited into his family. We are gathered by God himself and God expects from us that we will pay what he deserved. We will worship him, we will glorify and praise him. I do not recommend you worship people. We have to be careful. It is a prophetic picture. I do not invite you to worship people. What uh, this picture tells us about future, what will happen with us when Christ will be back. He will gather all nations around him and they will bow down to him. Joseph the Dreamer, part 2. We continue the story from book of Genesis 37, verses 8 through 11. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And as I told you, I don't believe that it was appropriate time for them to hear that, or maybe... The time was short and brothers weren't ready, but anyway, God delivered this message to them, this dream. And they interpreted it very close to the truth. The only problem was that God prepared Joseph to be kinsman redeemer, not only for his immediate family, but for many, many future people. And they, of course, didn't realize how great and amazing this picture was. They dwelt in the realm of their immediate family. And, of course, they hated him because in their eyes he has been boastful and too much prideful that he, that he told that. Verse 9, then he had another dream. So God continued giving dreams to him and he told it to his brothers listen very interesting listen when we listen properly we will hear the truth properly or we will be able to understand the truth i had another dream and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me 
So dream has been expanded, became so huge that it involved sun and moon and 11 stars. And of course we remember that beside him there were 11 brothers, right? <laughs> they were able to count. Verse 10, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His father realized, of course, that it is about his family. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Very interesting, very interesting note we see here. Before being jealous, we have to be able not only to listen what being said to us, but also we have to be able to keep, to store the matter until time will come to interpret it and to understand it correctly. Something what was said to us right now can be offensive because time didn't come yet, but we have to be patient. We, before becoming angry or jealous, we have to be patient. God will be able to interpret it. So mind is important. We have to fill mind with the proper beads of truth or prophecies. As I told you, I'll just remind that the Bible offers two explanations of the name Joseph or Yosef. First explanation, the word Asaf from the root, taking away. And she conceived, we read that from the scripture, and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And who has been taken away from us? Who was taken away from us? Jesus, right? He ascended to heaven. So why he ascended to heaven? In order for reproach to be taken away from me and you. And he constantly intercedes on behalf of you and me while he is at the throne. And he has been actually, his life has been taken away from him in order for me and for you to be those objects from whom reproach will be taken away. See how the name plays important role and describes the meaning or the, the role of the person which he will play in his life. And second explanation, the name in Hebrew Yosef, which means Yo, Yahweh, Yahweh, or and second part, Sef, add, Yahweh adds, Yahweh shall add. And she called his name Yosef and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. When reproach is taken away from me and you, we are able to see the Son who has been pierced on our behalf, who, whose life has been taken away from him, and who himself has been taken away back to the throne of mercy on our behalf. Amazing picture. And another son, of course, probably in her mind she thought about another physical son, her son. But prophetically she prophesied about another special son of God who will be an ultimate kinsman redeemer. This is absolutely amazing. I know maybe for you it looks like it too much. Try to grasp as much as you can, but this is amazing. The woman and the dragon. It is about future story which will come into our lives or our place in eternity is connected with this story. Taken from Revelation 12, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head, about whom it was written. What do you think? It is a prophetic picture. Who is that woman? Do you remember we just talked about a dream of Joseph? Sun, moon, and 11 stars. But now we see 12 stars. What do we see here? What this sign is about? Who is that woman? Israel. House of Israel. Yes. What does it mean, House of Israel? It means a family of all nations whom God added to himself as his children. That's what it means. And it says that woman clothed, have you noticed? Woman clothed with the sun. And who was the sun in the 
dream of Joseph, who was the son? Father, right? Israel, father or Jacob. Woman was clothed. What does it mean clothed? To be covered. To be covered. When we speak about kinsman redeemer, we speak about the cover or redemption. Redemption. We are redeemed on the basis of the promises which God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So she has been clothed. We are clothed. We are dressed on the basis of the God's promises. And second part of it, the moon was under her feet. Who was the moon in the story, in the dream of Joseph? His mother. His mother. So why then mother's role to be under the feet? I can tell you, it could be part of a foundation. Mother's teaching at the beginning of any human life is a part of absolutely fundamental learning experience, which person stays for all her or his life. Mother's teaching is fundamental, but also it represents trampling of something, trampling stepping on, ruling over. Do you remember who has been first enticed or deceived? Who has been deceived first? Eve. Eve, a woman. Deception came through a woman. And this wife, she's a special. I mean, this woman, she's a special. She represents God's children. So they trample deception, which came from a woman. Even women as a part of house of Israel, as a part of house of God, trample this deception or rule over it. And crown of 12 stars on her head. What does it mean? It means that all those 12 tribes as a stars, again as an object of God's promise. And she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Whom she's supposed to give birth? To Christ, to Messiah, right? House of Israel without Christ, without Messiah, is not wholesome, is not complete. And there are people who today do not see that Jesus is their Christ. I would tell you, it, it is mostly Semitic nations, Semitic nations, Jews and Arabs, they do not recognize Jesus as their Christ, as their Messiah. But she was pregnant. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. So we see a position appeared again as a sign in heaven. What we see here for now happens in heaven, not on earth, in heaven. So it is in a spiritual realm happens. But later it will come to the earthly realm. There is a difference. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. Is it possible for a dragon to devour a child? No, it is not possible. Do you remember what God said to a serpent? That you will bruise what? His heel. His heel. But the son of a woman will bruise a serpent to the head. Even he stood in front. He wasn't able to devour. He tried, but he wasn't able because it was not given to him. So it is not given to Satan to devour you at the beginning. God gives freedom to you and to me at the beginning. By God's divine provision, we are free. He wants for us to be developed and to grow. No one can snatch us right away. But at the end, it is given to Satan to bite us. So we have to be able, when we grow, grown enough, we have to be able to guard our heel because it is giving to the darkness to bite us. So we have to be wise enough to protect it. And he stood in front. Why he stood in front? He wanted to scare women. He wanted to discourage her. He wanted to suppress her. And Satan still today, he scares us by standing in front of us. 
and he is scary being but we have to trust God we shouldn't live by the sight we should live by faith so we should not be afraid of him when he stands in front of us because of God's promises we do not live by what we see we, we live by what we've heard what we've learned and what we've believed as a children of that woman as a part of this house she gave birth to a son a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter have you noticed it's not about love anymore why and it's in heaven we see still that in heaven what does it mean iron scepter iron scepter means domination it means authority which is self-sufficient independent and sometimes at, at times it is suppressive authority for those who are rebels for those who are disobedient iron scepter represents authority which which can push which can crush which can kill which can demolish those who are stand against so it is about military power it is about domination and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne that's exactly what happened with Jesus he's taken to his throne the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days why woman fled to the wilderness what is the wilderness for you and for me does it mean that it is not a harm it is not a place which beautiful by the harmony of God absolutely there is no wild places where there is no beauty of God right there is no places where God is not supreme commander there is no places which haven't been created by God but we as humans we consider wilderness something outside of our social humanly organized structures like places distant from the city can be considered as wilderness if there is nothing in it nor stores nor any other structures just plain ground or forest we consider it as a wilderness it's not necessarily should be just desert so wilderness any place which is not distracted or restructured by humans free from humans let's say it's not about sinful world it is about a world where there is no human touch just nature just nature we consider as humans we consider a wilderness a place where there is no influence of humans that's basically it's not about uh, it's not about wickedness it is about wild places like John the Baptist do you remember where John the Baptist, Baptist dwelt he dwelt in the wilderness and he said there is a voice of the Lord where in the wilderness you know why because God doesn't want to contaminate his message by humanly organized structures religion religion very often destructive element to the God's voice Amen. any religion including Christianity Amen. any religion so wilderness it is a place without religion without human structures or social structures and and woman fled to this area why because in this area God preparing for her his care to take care of her then war broke out in heaven so my recommendation for you when you will be overwhelmed enough to be ready to blow up move yourself to the nature move yourself away from humans away from people away from any structure move yourself stay in a place even for maybe for three days for five days just to be reorganized reshaped remolded and prepare it again to meet humans give rest for yourself God will take care of you at the place of the wilderness, at the quiet, peaceful place of his nature. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And you know what is the main duty of Archangel Michael? The main duty of Archangel Michael is to defend the house of Israel, to defend God's family. 
against dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back but he was not strong enough means uh, dragon and they lost their place in heaven now different realm we just talked about heaven now to the earthly realm we now at the earthly realm so the dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or satan who leads the whole world astray he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him so now we talk about earthly realm but still then i heard says john a loud voice in heaven so even even we are talking about earthly realm but we still able to hear the voices of heaven here on earth by hearing the voices of heaven here on earth we get connection with heaven that that's absolutely important absolutely important then i heard a loud voice in heaven now have come what now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom and the authority see for salvation power kingdom authority salvation say it. salvation power kingdom authority salvation power kingdom authority it is not enough just to have salvation there is a, there is a need of a power there is a need of a kingdom there is a need of authority because that's what real harmony and absolutely perfect future in god's eyes it contains four parts four parts salvation power kingdom of our god kingdom of our god and the authority of his christ kingdom of our god but authority of his christ which god gave to christ for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our god day and night has been hurled down does it mean that satan now is away no he is still at his duty to accuse me and you and when he accuses he really uses half of the truth and half of a lie he knows us he he studies us all the time and he accuses when he sees something which is wrong in us he immediately delivers it to god but the truth is that god loves us and he covered us by the promises do you remember woman is clothed with the promises with the son but even he accuses us before the god day and night we they triumphed over satan by what by two factors by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony we are secure by two factors first factor it is the blood of the lamb it is not our duty god covered us by the blood of the lamb but second is my and your duty what do we testify to people if we testify about ourselves poor we are but if we testify about Christ about what authority of Christ right kingdom of God power which is given to us and what salvation then we are secure and also it is written that they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death so love to our life is dangerous naturally we do love our lives but it is dangerous love we have to be very careful we should not negotiate we should not you know diminish what god gave to us he cover of his blood and the word of testimony by the by the expense by our attachment to our lives so lives should not go before those two otherwise we are in danger therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you woe to the earth and the sea what does it mean earth where we are now the sea where we would be 
in the near future before Christ will come. Sea represents abyss, which we call hell or storage for human souls, for human souls. And scripture says, the book of Revelation says that time will come when sea will release all souls. Those who drown, seamen, they will be released. And, and those dead people, their souls will be released to come back to earth. Because devil has gone down to his field with fury and he knows that his time is short. So there is no time to play with dragon. It is dangerous. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her where? In the wilderness. Do not try to support your life by human structures. Because the ultimate support comes when you are in the wilderness. Where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half a time, out of serpent's reach. Then, let's say first two wings of a great eagle, what does it speak about? In book of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 we read, Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Isaiah actually uh, predicted what, what was written later in the book of Revelation. But also those two wings, what those two wings represent? Verse 11, they triumphed over Satan by what? One wing. One wing is what? Blood of the Lamb. Another wing? Word of the testimony. It was given to us to prevail attacks. Yes, but, but where those two wings lead us? Blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony lead us to where? Verse 11. To the place prepared for her where? In the wilderness. Those wings are given to us not to stay on the top of high rise in New York. You know, some people prefer to move to the center of the city and to be well and to be prosperous. It, it, would, it wouldn't happen. For children of God, it wouldn't happen. Because any human structure can be used against children of God against their wellness, against their wellness. Those two wings, blood of the Lamb and uh, word of the testimony, are given for us to be well in a wilderness, where we will be supported. I am, I'm not talking that we should not live in cities. We should. But those two wings given to us, time by time, to go to the wilderness and to be nourished, to be supported, to be fed, to be restored. But when serpent saw that he couldn't reach out of the serpent's reach, verse 14, then from his mouth the serpent spewed what? Water like a river. Do you remember the expression waters of salvation? Living waters of salvation. They are different waters. Dirty, ugly, waters of accusation, also waters of delusion, delusion. I'm talking about philosophy, philosophy. Do you know what is the difference between philosophy and the word of God? Philosophy, philo, sophos, wisdom based on feelings. Feelings. Da, 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 feelings. <laughs> Those who base their lives on feelings would be suffering greatly. God's wisdom is not based on what we feel. God's wisdom is not based on what we think. God's wisdom actually is self-sufficient. And God's wisdom comes to us as a beautiful lady. Do you remember from the book of Proverbs? It comes to us as a beautiful lady who calls 
us to come to her and to be fed by her and to be nourished by her. So when, when serpent saw that a woman or children of God were out of his reach, he spewed from his mouth the philosophy, religious philosophy, religious philosophy or theology. Like a river. To what? To overtake the woman. To take control over the woman. And to sweep her away from her place. To sweep her away from where? Again, one wing is what? Blood of the Lamb. Another wing is what? Word of our testimony, right? about those four factors which God provided for us and what Satan wanted to do with this river from his mouth to take control over a woman because if a woman if we would not take control over a child of God we would not be able to sweep a child of God from the place where a child of God is taking care of do not allow everyone to take control over you by what they say. Even when they quote word of God to you, it doesn't mean that you have to give your head, you have to give your hand and to say, lead me. Amen. We have to be careful. We have to guard our hearts, our minds, the freedom which is giving to us. We have to be very careful. What? Because Satan constantly is trying to take control over us and sweep us away from where? From the place of the wilderness which God provided for us to take care of us out of the serpent's reach. So he wants to sweep us from that place back to the structures, human structures, human theologies, human teachings, the science of human creativity of deception to take control over our minds. I came from the world where they constantly try to take control over my mind. I don't remember if I told you, I was the only one student who went to the library, took those Marxism-Leninism books and read and, st and studied in attempt to understand. Just one student from 900-something nine, men. And only because I've done that, I've got excellent points. <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't understand. God blocked my mind from it. He didn't allow me to be poisoned by this deception. With the torrent, sweep, it is a very strong flow, very strong, powerful flow. Verse 16, but the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. What is it? Have you thought about this verse? I want to tell you something. God preordained carnality for fighting against philosophy of man. Carnality. How many times you thought that our carnality only a bad factor? No. Not always. We are absolutely divinely ordained and built beautifully. And carnality takes its place when, when it comes to the matter of philosophy. So carnality can swallow philosophy. Like in this case. Open it, its mouth and swallow the river. Which means the torrent has been weakened by carnality. You know why? Because serpent has been put on his belly. He moves by his belly. That's his way. So he is not able to escape that. It is his weakest link. Verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Rest of her offspring today are those people who keep, part of these people, they keep God's commands. And who are those people? 
not really, not really. Semitic nations are those people who are trying to keep, it is not possible to keep God's commandments. I mean, all commandments. It is not possible, but they try. They try it more fervently than we do. It says they keep God's Yes. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. Today, part of people, they hold fast the testimony about Jesus, but they do not keep commandments. And they are part of people who do keep commandments, but they do not hold fast the testimony about Jesus. So at the end of time, what's going to happen? God will gather. Do you remember how Joseph's name translated? is translated to add. He will add the rest of those people. He will add part of Israel who keeps God's commandment, but do not hold fast testimony of Jesus. And... I just want to tell you, we can go to many churches and we would ask how many commandments God gave to us. 99% or 95% of Christians would tell you two commandments, right? Huh? Yeah, try, try. Two commandments. <laughs> and, if you will, and if you will ask them to explain what does it mean, no one would explain you. No, not one. You know why? It is not possible to explain you what does it mean on the basis of two commandments. Because you have to take into consideration the rest commandments. Yeah. Simple observation. Simple observation. Do you know that we almost all of us, we sit here and we break one of the God's commandments. This commandment states you should not wear two different types of fabric on you. Yes. Yes, that's God's commandment. Jesus never abolished this commandment. You know why? Because when we do wear two different fabric like I, I wear cotton and synthetic. That's absolutely poisonous for our body. Polyester, absolutely poisonous. You know why? Because it serves as dielectric, dielectric. It kills electric transparency of our bodies. We as human beings, we carry certain potential of electricity in us. And God wants for us to interact with this world and with each other by this electrical magnetism or impulses. But are we not clothed in Christ's righteousness? Yes. But wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. Where it says that yes, we do, yes, we do clothe with Christ's righteousness. But what realm is it? A woman clothed with the sun. What realm it is? Do you remember I told you this chapter contains two realms? Heavenly realm, spiritual realm, and earthly realm, carnal realm. Does it mean that carnal realm is lower than the spiritual? In some sense, yes. But because we are creatures of God, we created beautifully and God loves us. And he knows that we have electrical potential in us and he wants for that electrical potential and those connections with the world to be perfect. So that is why he said, do not mix fabric which you dress for our good. But we say, Jesus abolished this. And why Jesus would abolish this? If God loves us, he knows how we are created and he wants the best for us. Do you see how this torrent from serpent's mouth, how he first takes control over... When I said takes control, I said takes control over our mind. Because if you will take control over human's mind, you will take control basically of their lives. And secondly, he wants to sweep us from the place of the wilderness into the world of human structures, including religious theology or teachings of the fathers. There is a difference between teaching of God and teaching of the fathers. I'm talking about fathers of the church. We have to be very careful because first priority is the scripture, word of God, and not denominational statements. I know maybe it, is, it sounds strange to you, but my responsibility to deliver it, your responsibility to examine very carefully, to examine it. And I can tell you more and more very interesting commandments like do not shave hairs above your ears. Why? 
because it is a sign to angels, to one third of the angels, that a person is available for a male or for female who are shaved. It is a sign that the, uh, this person is available to one third of the angels who are under Satan's rule. Jesus never came to abolish that because that's how ordained, ordained this world until, until Christ will rule with his iron scepter. So we have to be sensitive, we have to be wise, wise. Again, what is wilderness? Wilderness is a world ordained just by God without human touch. And God prepared this world for me and you to be nourished, to be taken care of. It was tough, I know, it was tough, but you are spiritual, this one is last slide. Who is our hope or joy or crown of happiness? Said Paul, it is you, you, that's what scripture says. <laughs> Who is our hope or joy or crown of happiness? It is you, wrote Paul, when you stand before our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes again. God prepared it for us to be his hope, to be his joy, to be his crown of happiness because he loves us. Any, any child who is beloved is a hope, joy, or crown of happiness for his parents, right? So we are beloved children of God. But when we stand before our Lord Jesus Christ, then we are secure. And he will come back to provide ultimate what? Salvation, power, kingdom of God, and authority of Christ, right? May God bless you. I know it, it is a little bit challenging, but it is necessary. It is necessary. It is necessary for our spirits. It is a spiritual food, absolutely pure spiritual food. Let me pray. Father God, I know that I touch some religious pillars, some religious foundations of human teaching or human doctrines. But I ask you, Father, be merciful and help us to be open for your lead. When you provide for us those two wings, one is a wing of uh, being covered by the blood of your son, and another wing is a word of our testimony about you. You provided those wings for us to be taken care of, to be led into the wilderness where we can be nourished. To the place, actually, it is not wilderness. <laughs> it is a place of your dwelling. It is a place of your presence where we can be supported, where we can be fed, where we can be secured and, and take deep rest. And I pray for every human soul here that you would help us to take deep rest in you to be restored and to be prepared for the battle where you are an ultimate victor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.